think we'll get started. Um, good morning. We have a couple of presenters today. The first one will be uh, Dr. Derek Holt, and he's going to share with us some of his research he's been doing in Dr. Mbadi's lab. And his title is Identification of Graver Two as a Novel Regulator of Export One. Okay. Thanks, Leah. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm uh, happy to have a chance to talk a little bit about some of the research I've been able to do with uh, Dr. Ambadi. Um, I'm sure that uh, everyone here will agree that the eye is the most amazing organ in the body. And um, part of the elegant structure of the eye involves um, proper vascular demarcation. And there are two important and striking examples illustrated here of that ocular um, vascular demarcation. The first is the uh, boundary between the avascular cornea and the vascularized uh, conjunctiva, which we call the corneal limbus. Uh, the second example is the avascular outer retina. So this is uh, some immunofluorescence uh, of the retina where uh, this perlican stains blood vessels red and DAPI stains nuclei blue. And you can see that the outer retina is avascular, and that's separated, the avascular outer retina is separated from the highly vascularized choroid by this, uh, the RPE Brooks membrane complex. So anytime, so the, um, the Embody Lab is very interested in uh, blood vessels. We're interested in blood vessels. We're interested in um, vasculature in the eye, things that make blood vessels grow in the eye and molecular factors that prevent blood vessels from growing places where they're not supposed to be. And when you're talking about regulation of blood vessel growth, uh, one of the most important factors, of course, is VEGF. And this year marks 40 years since the original identification of a diffusible factor that regulates blood vessel growth. So <coughs> in 1971, Judah Folkman uh, identified through painstaking biochemistry work from um, actually multiple different tumor sources. Uh, they isolated biochemical fractions that had biological activity that in, in a rat assay of neovascularization uh, led to blood vessel growth when you added some of these biochemical fractions. And so this is the, the model slide from Folkman's original paper where they uh, postulated that this diffusible factor that they called tumor angiogenesis factor was secreted by tumors and led to growth of blood vessels into the tumor to enable the tumor to, to get larger. And, you know, 40 years later, we know that the situation is actually much more complex. And we call this factor now VEGF. But in fact, there are multiple different genes within the VEGF family. And each, many of those genes within the VEGF family actually exist in multiple different splicing isoforms. And in addition to that, different members of the VEGF family bind to multiple different VEGF receptors. And uh, I have focused my research on VEGF receptor 1. And scientists, like physicians, like to give multiple names to the same thing. So we also call VEGF uh, R1 FLT1, and that's what I'll call it for the rest of the talk. Now, the situation is even a little more complex than what is diagrammed here because these receptors actually exist in different isoforms as well. And uh, those different isoforms of the FLINT1 gene are generated by alternative RNA processing. So to give you just a context of what I mean by alternative RNA processing, first I'll briefly review some fundamental molecular biology about normal sort of canonical RNA processing. Um, so the central dogma of molecular biology, right, is that DNA makes RNA and RNA makes protein. And the DNA to RNA step actually involves multiple um, <coughs> different processing steps. That includes, so if we look at the um, genomic DNA, that's uh, transcribed into a uh, pre-mRNA that undergoes uh, formation of a five prime cap, splicing out of introns, and addition, and three prime cleavage and polydentylation. So in the case of the FLT1 gene, uh, the pre-mRNA can undergo RNA processing along two different pathways. The, the first we can consider is kind of the more canonical situation where um, the FLT1 gene contains 30 exons, 
In this case, all the introns are spliced out, and the 30 exons are spliced together, and cleavage and polydanylation occur downstream of exon 30. And that results in formation of a full-length uh, receptor that has a ligand binding domain, a transmembrane domain, and an intracellular signaling domain, like the diagrams in the, the previous slide. However, if this pre-mRNA um, instead undergoes cleavage and polyadenylation within intron 13, that results in production of a truncated RNA that is stable and produces a uh, isoform that contains the ligand binding domain only and not a transmembrane domain, so therefore it's soluble. This full-length protein uh, binds to VEGF and elicits VEGF signaling within the cell, so it acts as a VEGF agonist. This soluble protein can bind VEGF, but it doesn't elicit any signals, and so it ac acts as a soluble decoy and actually is a VEGF antagonist. So um, we have been very interested in studying the biology of this uh, soluble isoform, S-split, and a lot of work, some of which I've reviewed in previous talks, uh, but none of which I will review in detail today, uh, has shown that S-split is a key regulator of um, the vascular demarcations within the eye. So these are the two, uh, two of the uh, important examples of vascular demarcation that are both critical for, for vision um, that we discussed earlier. And we now know that S-split is critical for corneal avascularity. Loss of S-split leads to growth of blood vessels into the cornea. And it's also critical for the avascularity of the outer retina, is loss of S-split leads to choroidal neovascularization. So these are some FA and OCT images of, of uh, mouse models where uh, FLT1 has been knocked out um, or versus control. So um, if we're going to understand the biology of S-FLT better, the production of S-FLT hinges on this critical RNA processing event. So what is known at this point about this RNA processing event? Well, um, it's, it was known for, for some time that there were a few other genes that underwent the same sort of alternative processing. It wasn't just the soluble VEGF receptor 1, soluble VEGF receptor 2, uh, the neuropillin receptor, or a couple of examples. But recently, a group from uh, New York actually found that this was a much more widespread um, mechanism of alternative processing than was, than was previously appreciated. And in fact, it seems to be a property of receptor tyrosine kinases in general. So this is kind of a busy slide, but you can see that there are multiple receptor tyrosine kinase families here. And in fact, members of all these families were found to generate both uh, soluble and, and full-length isoforms. And you can see some of those isoforms identified here. So it's kind of a general property for, of receptor tyrosine kinases. This group also went on to show that, in fact, the U1 SNRNA, which is involved in uh, splicing, is also involved in inhibiting intronic polydenylation. So in that way, the U1 SNRNA promotes formation of the full-length protein. And what they were able to show is that by blocking U1 function, they were able to induce production of the soluble isoform. So what we know now is that U1 SNRNA through inhibition of intronic polydenylation leads to formation of the full length isoform. But we've been interested in some time in trying to identify factors that promote formation of s -flet. And when we were thinking about this project, um, we thought, well, how would we go about identifying these, these factors? And we came up with, with a strategy that involved several steps. So first we thought, well, if there's a gene that promotes production of s -flet, then tissues that express high levels of s -flet should probably express high levels of this protein, and vice versa. So can we identify a set of genes whose expression mirrors that of s -flet? Because we might have a, uh, be able to identify a candidate within that set. If we can identify a set of genes um, that has the correct expression pattern, then can we find within that set a gene that looks like it could be involved in RNA processing? So by inspecting the protein domain structure and known function of the gene, is there one that would make sense in terms of pos a possible role in RNA processing? 
If we could find that, then could we do some functional experiments and show that if we change the expression of gene X, we also change the expression of S split. If it is a regulator of S split, then that's, that would be critical to be able to demonstrate that. We'd also like to be able to place that uh, functional effect uh, within a relevant biological context. So um, if we modify expression of uh, gene X, do we get a phenotype that is relevant and that makes sense in terms of regulation of that split? If we can show both of these uh, functional uh, things to be true, then we would like to be able to localize this particular gene to the RNA of interest. If it's involved in, uh, in um, alternative RNA processing, then we'd like to do some experiments that directly look at association of the factor in question with the FLT1 RNA. And if we can demonstrate all of these, then we'd like to think about ways that we can get at the molecular mechanism of action. How could it actually be involved in RNA processing? So first let's look at our efforts to identify uh, factors whose expression mirrored that of s -flip. Now, this data has been presented uh, before, and so I'm going to go over it very uh, quickly. What we did was identified a relevant model of uh, corneal neovascularization. We identified two mouse strains, the MRL mice, also called the healer mice, that are resistant to corneal neovascularization. The PAC6 heterozygous null mice that undergo spontaneous corneal neovascularization. Both these mice are derived from the same wild type background which has an intermediate susceptibility to corneal neovascularization. <laughs> and as you would uh, suspect, S-split is the key regulator of corneal avascularity. It's expressed at high levels in the MRL corneas, at low levels in the S-split corneas. And so what we did was, well, let's look at the genome-wide expression, the expression of all genes in the corneas of these mice, see if we can identify factors that have the same pattern of expression. So we did that. And this is the set of genes that we pulled out. This is the microarray data represented uh, in heat map form. Each row here represents a probe on the array. Each column represents a different mouse. And it's color coded according to expression level. So the bright colors means high level of expression, and dark color means a low level of expression. You can see that um, just for this whole table of about 80 genes or so, it's bright on the left and dark on the right. So they're expressed at high levels in MRL, lower levels in PAC-6. So we were able to do the first step and find a set of genes whose expression mirrored that of s -flip. The next step would be to look through this set and see if we can find a gene that looks interesting. And so we did that and found a gene, RAVER2, obviously the title of the talk alludes to the fact that this is the one that we've been studying, we're interested in. And the first thing we did was confirmed using a different method that yes, RAVER2 is, a, this is um, real-time PCR of uh, expression data, mRNA expression data in the cornea that shows like s -flip, which is expressed at high levels in MRL and lower levels in PAC6, RAVER2 also is expressed at higher levels in MRL and lower levels in PAC6. Now why did we pick RAVER2? What is known about RAVER2? Well, it's part of this small RAVER family of genes. There's a RAVER1 and a RAVER2. Each of them have three RRM domains. It stands for an RNA recognition motif. Uh, they have nuclear localization signals and um, leucine-rich region. So just the domain structure, the fact that they have these RNA recognition motifs suggests that they could be involved in, in uh, RNA processing potentially. What do we know about the biology of uh, these two factors? Well, both co-localization and structural studies, this is some NMR spectroscopy data, show that RAVER1 can interact with PTB, the polypyrimidine tract binding protein, which is a well-studied um, RNA processing factor. Okay. We'll talk more about PTB a little later. So RAVER1 is known to interact with, with a factor that regulates RNA processing and experiments with um, splicing uh, reporter in a splicing reporter system show that RAVER2 regulates splicing. Oh, RAVER1, I'm sorry. RAVER2, a little less is known about it, but co-localization and co-immunoprecipitation studies also show that RAVER2 can interact with PTB. So this looks like a factor that could be involved in regulation of RNA processing. 
So we found a candidate that makes some sense um, in terms of a, a possible regulator. Now we'd like to look if modifying expression of Raver2 changes S split expression. So it's a simple idea. If Raver2 promotes production of S split, if we decrease the levels of Raver2, we should block this and decrease the levels of S split. So how will we go about doing this? Well, we'd like to use an siRNA mediated system. siRNAs are small RNAs that are targeted to, uh, can be targeted in a sequence specific manner to a specific RNA that through this uh, risk complex leads to uh, some slicing and uh, down regulation then of the target RNA. So we thought let's look, let's perform siRNA mediated Raver2 knockdown in both an in vivo system by injecting plasmids that bear Raver2 siRNAs into a uh, mouse cornea and an in vitro system, one that's relevant to blood vessels, HUVAC, this is a human umbilical vein endothelial cells, endothelial cells, transfect these siRNAs into the cell culture. So um, when we did the uh, injections into mouse cornea, we saw first of all that um, injection of a control plasmid did not result in significant change in Raver2 expression, but injection of two different siRNAs targeting Raver2 resulted in about a 30% knockdown of Raver2 expression that was reproducible and statistically significant. So that's great. We were able to knock it down um, in, the, in the cornea. So what happens to s split? Well, again, injection of the control siRNA did not change s split levels significantly, but injection of either of the uh, Raver2 siRNAs resulted in um, decreased expression of s split that was both reproducible and statistically significant. The levels of the membrane-bound isoform did not change significantly, and the levels of a control gene, like GAPDH, did not change significantly. Um, we did a similar s experiment in uh, HUVAC cell culture and saw similar results, that is, uh, reproducible and significant um, knockdown of Raver2 and decreased expression levels of S-split without a change in the membrane-bound isoform. So, it's a, so this was great. We were able to show that if you decrease uh, Raver2 expression, you knock down the S-split RNA. We also wanted to show that this resulted in changes in S-split protein expression because it's really the protein that is functional. So um, those mouse corneas are really, really small. It's kind of hard to harvest enough of those and get, get uh, be able to do uh, protein expression assays. So we decided to do this in the HUVAC cells. So this is a soluble protein. It's secreted into the culture media. We can look at expression levels of the protein in the culture media. So we did that by Western blotting. You can see that um, a mock transfection versus uh, controlled transfection. We compare these two. There's no significant change. By Western blotting, we can see decreased intensity of the band with treatment of either of the Raver2 siRNAs. We can do this a little more quantitatively using ELISA. And again, we see reproducible and significant knockdown of S-flip protein levels within the culture media uh, following treatment with Raver2 siRNAs, whereas the total level of protein in the culture media was unchanged. So that's great. We were able to show a functional effect in terms of S-flip expression, that by d knocking down Raver2, we decrease the expression of S-flip. Next, can we put this in a biological context and show a phenotypic effect that makes sense in a relevant model? And so we chose to look um, in the cornea again and see if we could induce corneal nevascularization. So again, these are some representative photographs. So following injection of uh, buffer alone, we see a cornea that is beautifully clear with no uh, neovascularization. Injection of the control siRNA also results in a uh, nice clear cornea. There's, there's no change there. But injection of the Raver2 siRNA results in marked corneal neovascularization, which I wasn't sure how the picture would show up. We can highlight a little bit. You can see the blood vessels there, obviously. And um, the same effect was seen with injection of the other uh, Raver2 siRNA. All right, so this is great. So we see a phenotypic effect 
that makes sense in terms of um, regulation of S-flip. All right, so the next step would be to, to show that Raver2 acts at the level of the FLT1 pre-mRNA. So can we localize it to the FLT1 pre-mRNA? And how would we go about doing that? Well, we can use a technique called RNA immunoprecipitation, or RIP. And in this technique, we harvest first a cell lysate that contains a mixture of RNAs, some of which are bound by RNA-associated proteins we can identify generically as an RNP here. So we harvest this cell lysate, we subject it to an immunoprecipitation with an antibody specific to, an, to our RNA binding factor of interest or a control antibody. And that will enrich for RNAs that are bound by the protein of interest. Then we can isolate the RNA and analyze it any way we like. People do arrays, people do sequencing. If you know the gene you're interested in, the, the best way to look at it is just uh, gene-specific PCR. So we did this experiment in HUVEX cells that express a flag-tagged version of RAVER2. One reason for that is because um, the flag antibody is just a beautiful antibody. It immunoprecipitates very well. It's very clean. So um, we went ahead and did this experiment, and this is uh, an agaros an ethidium stained agarose gel uh, showing the results from um, this is the flag immunoprecipitation, a control immunoprecipitation, uh, IP with a RAVER2 polyclonal antibody. So these two antibodies will both recognize RAVER2 in different ways. Um, and then a control antibody for the uh, polyclonal experiment. And then we did PCR for our gene of interest. FLT1, and we saw a uh, pull down of the FLT1 RNA with both the flag monoclonal, and this is a weak band, but it's there and it's reproducible with the RAVER2 polyclonal. So this is great. We were, we were able to localize RAVER2 to the FLT1 RNA. These other bands here just represent primer dimer from the PCR. So um, now, you know, we've been able to show that RAVER2 has the correct expression for an S-FLT regulator. It is functionally important in terms of regulating S-FLT expression levels and that it localizes to the FLT1 RNA. Now, let's try to think about what it might be doing there. And again, we know that, uh, at least in uh, the other studies were done in HeLa cells, that RAVER2 and its homolog, RAVER1, can associate with PTB. So the first thing was to show that this association between RAVER2 and PTB exists within our, um, with, within our relevant system, like endothelial cells. So we did in, uh, an immunoprecipitation experiment in HUVEC, uh, followed by uh, Western blotting for immunoprecipitation of RAVER2 followed by Western blotting for PTB. So this is a co-immunoprecipitation experiment. And so we can see that uh, this is our input lane, and then we pull down from the same input with a control antibody and with the RAVER2 polyclonal antibody, and then do a Western blot for PTB. And we can see significant enrichment of PTB in the RAVER2 IP relative to control IP. So this uh, indicates that RAVER2 associates with PTB in uh, our endothelial cells. So what do we know about PTB? Well, it binds to this region called a polypyrimidine tract, which is um, found in uh, introns, and it is well known, PTB is well known to uh, repress uh, splicing. However, PTB has a lot of other functions too. It is known in some cases to activate splicing. It can activate or repress cleavage and polydentylation. It can regulate mRNA stability, mRNA localization. It can even regulate translation by um, regulating internal ribosomal intrasites. <coughs> in terms of, uh, of these different functions, the, the two that would make the most sense for us in terms of um, regulating the alternative processing of S-FLT would be either repression of splicing or activation of cleavage and polydenylations. Either one of those could lead to formation of the truncated isoform. So if PTB is associating with RAVER2 and playing a role in FLT1 processing, the next thing to be able to show is that PTB also localizes to the FLT1 RNA. So we can do the same experiment, a RIP experiment for PTB, 
And so that was done. We can see the PTB immunoprecipitation and a control immunoprecipitation, and again, PCR for FLT1, and we can see that we're able to pull down the FLT1 RNA uh, in the PTB, but not in the control. The PTB is better studied, so we know some genes that should be targeted by PTB and other genes that should not be targeted by PTB. It's actually been studied on a genome-wide scale. Um, so this is a nice control for our RIP experiments to be able to show pull down of a known PTB regulated gene and to show that we don't pull down a gene that is known to, to not be bound by PTB. So um, the next step that we were interested in was, was seeing what happens, w is there a relationship between binding a PTB to the FLT1 RNA and, and RABR2? So um, we decided to do a sequential experiment where we knocked down RAVR2 first and then did RNAIP to see if that affected occupancy of PTB at the, at the FLT1 RNA. And so this um, is the data for that experiment. We can see that uh, the HUVAC cells were treated with, with either um, RAVR2 siRNAs or control treatments, either control siRNA or a mock um, siRNA treatment. And then immunoprecipitation was performed either with a PTB monoclonal antibody or control antibody. And then PCR was performed for uh, FLT1. And what we can see is that in the control situation, uh, we pulled down PTB, as we saw before. But when we knocked down RAVR2, we pulled down significantly less PTB. So this suggests that um, PTB association with FLT1 is in is at least in part RAVR2 dependent, that if you decrease RAVR2 levels, you decrease occupancy of PTB on the FLT1 RNA. So we've been able to start to um, put together some of the other processing factors that might be involved and start to get at a molecular mechanism of action for RAVR2. So um, again, we return back to this critical processing event, and what we and now know is that U1 through intronic poly A inhibition promotes um, formation of the full length protein. Uh, the data I've showed you today um, supports a model wherein RAVR2, um, likely in association with PTB, promotes production of the soluble isoform. And given what we know about PTB, it's we're, we're favoring a model in which it either does this by intronic poly A activation or by splicing repressions. So we've, you know, uh, generated a lot of new questions now with this data and a lot of future directions. Um, some of the things that we're considering is, um, I showed you that lots of receptor tyrosine kinases are regulated by this kind of um, alternative RNA processing. So does RAVR2 and PTB regulate the expression of other receptor tyrosine kinase genes. What other complexes are involved? Can we show that the cleavage polyvanillation factors versus splicing factors are involved? Um, we'd like to be able to localize regulatory sequence elements within intron 13 that are important for this processing event, map binding sites for RAVR2 and PTB within intron 13, and of course look at what happens when we knock down PTB. What happens to expression of S-flit and M-flit and what happens to RAVR2 occupancy? All right, then finally, of course, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Ambadi uh, it's for his uh, wonderful mentorship and for allowing me to, to do this work in his lab. There are lots of people in the Ambadi lab who have been instrumental and helpful in this, in this work. Uh, I think, like to thank Dr. Olson and Dr. Mifflin for giving me the opportunity to have some time in the lab. And of course, I'd like to thank my wonderful family and thank all of you for listening. This is my big boys here. We went for a little hike up Little Cottonwood Canyon to uh, a little waterfall a few weeks ago, and then we went to the new Museum of Natural History, which was really fun a little while ago. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Well, um, 
I think we have a pretty good story right now, but what? But the main thing that we'd like to figure out now is whether or not it's it's acting primarily through a cleavage and polydentylation pathway or a splicing pathway. And those two are interrelated, of course, but um, there are some experiments that we're trying to set up now to try and address that. Um, so I think that's the that's the first thing. Um, I I think that what makes the most sense is that raver 2s function actually is to target PTB there. And then PTB helps to uh, either inhibit splicing and make the intron available or activate the intronic polydentylation through interaction with the cleavage and polydentylation machinery. So we're trying to figure out, first of all, which pathway in general is involved. And then we can try to figure out exactly which cleavage and polydentylation factor is being uh, recruited by the complex or, you know, how, how it may be interrupting splicing. No, um, the crystal structure, I don't think the crystal structure of Raver 1 or Raver 2 is known, but um, it certainly Raver 2 is not known. There's really only two papers that have ever been published on Raver 2. Um, it, you know, it, it would be interest. it would be useful to map the, the regions of Raver 2 that are important for interaction with PTB. And um, some of those experiments have been done, at least I know for sure, in the setting of Raver 1. So we could get some idea from cosmology to Raver 1 in terms of the, the uh, domains it could be important. And those could be important mutants to use in the experiment. Yeah, there's, there's lots of ways that we could think of using those. Not that I know of, mm -mm. but I'd like to look at that. Okay, thank you. <laughs>